Welcome to e Shala, PG program in Japanese. You are through paper 05, that's communication through translation. Hon ya kutsuji no communication. And I'll take you to module 3, overview of translation studies. Hon ya kugaku no gaiyo. You all know, I'm Ashok Chabla, Chief Scientist and Head Translation Division, CSAR NISCARE, and also visiting professor at APU and uh, visiting faculty at JNU. Let's try to recapitulate what we have done in the previous modules. Translation has been a major activity since the ancient times. French tradition indicates that the focus shifted from religious texts to literature. In other words, from quantity to quality in 16th to 17th century. Well, even if the period may vary, the trend probably was same in the case of Russia, India, and maybe China, etc. also. Russia and India had similarities with regard to multilingual environment within the within as well as around the respective countries. Therefore, the need for the translation and also for the different categories of translators is something of a natural occurrence. History of translation or the translation traditions may go back much beyond what has been perceived so far or what has been traced so far. It may not be easy though to trace back the history, the traditions due to lack of documentary evidences. There could have been certain cases where the individuals might have pursued the translation for their individual needs, but more or less the translation in all probabilities was more of a state-sponsored activity. It may not be appropriate to set initiation limit for translation studies as well. In fact, history of translation studies may not carry any significant meaning as long as the important aspects that could have been studied in the past are listed and are put to use for understanding or for deepening our knowledge about the translation, it serves the purpose. And new aspects as and when found from any previous studies need to be included. Let us from this perspective see some of the studies that have been carried so far for a rational futuristic approach. Well, going to the introduction of this module, it may not be appropriate to set initiation limit for the translation studies as well. In fact, history of translation studies may not carry any significant meaning as long as the important aspects that could have been studied in the past are listed and used to deepen the understanding regarding translation, particularly the practice of translation. And new aspects as and when found from any previous study can and should be added to establish further the depth of domain. Let us from this perspective look at some of the works that have been done so far to understand the translation studies of so far and set the tone for a rational futuristic approach. As per Routledge, English term translation first attested in around 1340 derives either from old French translation or directly from the Latin translatio which means transporting itself coming from the principle of the verb transferi to carry over. Translation between two different written languages involve the changing of an original written text, source text or ST in other words, in the original verbal language, source language or SL, into a written text that is the target text or TT in a different verbal language which is which can be called target language or the TL. Generally, translation is a process of rendering meaning, ideas or messages of a text from one language to other language. According to ND, one of the most prominent definitions of translation is stated by Newmark in 1988, who defines translation as rendering the meaning of a text into another language in the way that the author intended the text. Nida and Tevar in 1982 on the other hand stated, translating consists in reproducing in the receptor language the closest natural equivalent of the source language message. Further, Rochaya and uh, Mona Baker, Rochaya in 2001 and Mona Baker much earlier, that is in 1992, had underlined the term meaning equivalence because it is the meaning which is transferred in the target language. Well, this has been debated by various people in different ways. Conclusion from the available definitions can be called as follows. It is very clear that the translation is a process 
which is intended to find the meaning equivalence in the target text. Let us see the difference between translation and certain other concepts. First, translation versus transliteration. Transliteration is the practice of transcribing a word or text written in one writing system into another writing system or system of rules for such practice. From a linguistic point of view, transliteration is a mapping from one system of writing into another, letter by letter or ideally phoneme by phoneme. To understand it more clearly or more easily, what it means is that when you hear a phoneme, you register the phoneme and you reproduce that phoneme, you don't have to read the text. That means you can go phoneme by phoneme. Let's see translation versus adaptation. Routledge explains adaptation as a set of translative operations which result in a text that is not accepted as a translation but is nevertheless recognized as representing a source text of about the same length. As a translating technique, Vinay 1958 defined adaptation in a technical and objective way as follows. Adaptation is a procedure which can be used whenever the context referred to in the original text does not exist in the culture of the target text, thereby necessitating some form of recreation. Uh, what you can understand by adaptation is that you get some uh, concept or some text from a culture which is different than your culture and you want to have the same feel in your culture so you try to adapt it that means the content or the language might have to be changed adaptation is sometimes regarded as a form of translation which is characteristic of particular genres like advertising and subtitling but most notable drama most notably it is the drama it is in relation to drama translation that adaptation has been most frequently studied. I am sure you might have heard about this drama or this picture is the adaptation of such and such story in from a particular country or from some different language. Adaptation is perhaps most easily justified when the original text is of a metalinguistic nature, that is when the subject matter of the text is language itself. This is especially so with the did didactic works on language generally or on specific languages. Let us go to the new concept. You might have or may not have heard the localization. You must have heard the localization or indigenization of products or components. There is something called localization of the brand or the product in that sense. Wikipedia explains language localization as the process of adapting a product that has been previously translated into multiple languages to a specific country or region. Let us for example take a coke can going to for example Arab country where it is it was not there so far. If you try to put the words which were there in US or try to put the logos which were used in the US they may have to be adapted to some extent that is adaptation. But suppose you change the script, you bring in some photographs which are local, you may probably change the shape of the can. So it is not only the language, it is a complete comprehensive package which is localized there. Localization is a process which is most generally related to the cultural adaptation and translation of software, video games and websites as well as uh, audio voice over video or other multimedia content and less frequently uh, to any written translation. Let us see another concept, translation versus transcreation. According to Wikipedia, transcreation is a term used chiefly by advertising and marketing professionals to refer to the process of adapting a message from one language to another while maintaining its intent, style, tone and context. The goal of transcreation is to transfer the intent, style, vocal tone and emotional salience of the message from the source language to that of the targeted audience. The process thus requires expertise in marketing as well as linguistic skills and a firm grasp of targeted cultures. Last slide repeated. Let us now talk about the different categories of translations. 
you might have heard about uh, free translation, word to word translation, contextual translation. I have talked about uh, a concept called transposition. That means the concept or the meaning from one language, which can be the source text, is transpositioned in the target language. Let's see how uh, others have defined or how others have categorized the translation. On linguistic, uh, linguistics aspects of translation, Jacobson's categories are as follows. Number one is intralingual translation or rewording and interpretation of verbal signs by means of other signs of the same language. Intralingual translation would occur when we produce a summary or otherwise rewrite a text in the same language, say a children's version of an encyclopedia. The second category is interlingual translation or translation proper an interpretation of verbal signs by means of some other language. It is interlingual translation between two different verbal sign systems that has been the traditional focus of translation studies. The third category is intersemiotic translation or transmutation. It is an interpretation of verbal signs by means of signs of nonverbal sign systems. Intersemiotic translation, for example, occurs when a written text is translated into a different mode, such as music, film, or painting. There are interesting examples available. Uh, I would like to quote two here. First is the Jeff Wayne's famous 1978 musical version of H.G. Wells' science fiction novel, The War of the Words, produced in 1898, which was then adopted for the stage in 2006. Or you might have heard about uh, Gurinder Chadha's 2004 Bollywood's Pride and Prejudice adaptation of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Let's go to the academic discipline part of the translation and the translation studies. By 2008, in the European Union alone, the turnover of translation and interpreting industry was estimated at 5.7 billion euros. If you talk at the world level, this definitely must be more than double or maybe few times. Yet the study of translation as an academic subject only really began in the second half of the 20th century in the modern times. Translation studies is an academic discipline that studies the theory and practice of translation. It is by nature a multilingual but also interdisciplinary field of study since it establishes relationships with the linguistics, cultural studies, philosophy, the information sources, information science, and so on. As a discipline, translation studies is also polymorphic. In other words, it means variety of approaches can be applied. Variety of approaches does not mean there is a total freedom. What it means is that there are certain set rules and then individuals have the freedom to adopt their own or use their own styles. In the English speaking world, the discipline which is now known as translation studies was established thanks to the Dutch based US scholar James S. Holmes. In his key defining paper delivered in 1972, Holmes describes the then nascent discipline as being concerned with the complex of problems clustered around the phenomenon of translating and translations. By 1995, in the second revised edition of her translation studies, an integrated approach Mary Hombai was able to talk in the previous of the breathtaking development of translation studies as an independent discipline and the prolific international discussion on the subject took place around that time. Mona Baker, in her introduction to the first edition of the Routledge Encyclopedia of Translation, that is Baker and uh, Baker in 1998 probably, talked effusively of the richness of the exciting new discipline, perhaps the discipline of the 1990s, bringing together, together scholars from a wide variety of often more traditional areas. Further, in 2008, the second edition of the encyclopedia shows how far this discipline has evolved 
it comments on new concerns in the discipline, its growing multidisciplinary aspects, and its commitment to break away from its exclusive or exclusively Eurocentric origins while holding on to the achievements of the past decades. I have been talking about it that in past also people have done a lot of work and in the unknown past also people definitely must have done a lot of work. Whatever we do now does have some, some novice or certain things which are new but the past the work done in the past decades is as important as what we have been doing now. Let us now go to the rise and growth of translation studies. There are four very visible ways in which translation studies uh, have become more prominent. Uh, it is explained here below. The first, let us see the first one. Just as the demand for translation has soared, so has there been a vast expansion in specialized translating and interpreting programs at both undergraduate and post postgraduate level. In other words, it can be said that it is the market driven uh, pulls that made the universities or the departments to consider introducing the new programs that could be undergraduate or postgraduate. Some of the universities were quite futuristic who started the programs much before the market generated the demand. Second, the past decades have also seen a proliferation of conferences, books and journals on translation in many languages. Uh, there have been some organizations in India, for example, Indian Scientific Translators Association, ISTA, which had been organizing certain conferences or certain seminars uh, at least once a year. And then universities used to organize such seminars or conferences, may not be once a year, but maybe at a frequency of once in three years or four years. Third, as the number of publications increased, so has the demand for general and analytical instruments such as anthologies, databases, encyclopedias, handbooks and introductory texts. Some among these are translation studies, then contemporary translation, the Routledge Encyclopedia of Translation Studies. Uh, Baker and Baker and others have worked and given so much of uh, uh, literature to read, Dictionary of Translation Studies. There are some works which have not uh, been given the shape of books, but they are available either on either in the hard copy form or some of these have been scanned and put on the internet also. Fourth, international organizations have also prospered. Famous among these is International Federation of Translators, that is FIT, which was established in 1953. It brought together nationally and internationally bodies such as the Canadian Association for Translation, uh, Translation Studies, Association, uh, the other associations. It brought together nationally and internationally bodies such as the Canadian Association for Translation Studies, CATS, which was found in, founded in Ottawa in 1987, the European System for Translation Studies, EST 1992 in Vienna, among others from around the globe. Rise and growth of translation studies were seen even in the case of India. In India, translation and translation studies were led by few institutions in mostly public domain since uh, 1970s. These included uh, Textile Association uh, in Ahmedabad in state of Gujarat, it is called Atira, then Heavy Industry Public Sector Company, uh, Bharat Heavy Electrical Limited in Haridwar, different foreign language departments of uh, University of Delhi and Jawaharlal Nehru University and also Jamia Millia Islamia University. Then English and foreign language university Hyderabad also played an important role. Various IITs also uh, played very important role. Then defense research organization DESIDOC and NISCARE which was called INSDOC in those days under the umbrella of CSIR, were they played the pivotal role. These organizations, uh, if you see carefully, IIT will have some professors or faculty going abroad, living there for four years, five years or ten years. And while doing their studies in that domain, in their own domain, 
they picked up the language of the country also and when they landed up here because of the paucity of the translators they also joined the translator fraternity and the team became a very big team you know although these organizations were involved in translation or in fact the individuals from these organizations were involved in translation some of these organizations did have uh, departments dedicated for translation the research or the studies were mainly centered around erstwhile in stock where practicing translators had an active academic body called ista which i have talked about earlier also it's indian scientific translators association which also had its own journal called gista journal of ista and the veteran people were working uh, in this activity they included swami bhattacharya ramani mannar dhaka nambyar bhardwaj saxena batnagar bhatia mohandas jayantre bandyopadhyay das gupta myself chabla sampat vatsa bakaya unni chakravarti pande mittal talgiri varma motwani george alamelu dhingra bhatti kunte ramakrishna from different organizations and they participated in a very active manner as the time passed the momentum shifted to, uh, to ongoing translation training program of nescare in 2009 uh, which have been continuing since then and the research output includes papers on various areas uh, for example accuracy readability style machine translation core peripheral contextual implied cpci concept evaluation matrix and benchmarking etc these are just the representative examples which have been given here there are various areas on which uh, the trainees have been working for last about 5 to 6 years now if we look at the related domains we'll find that the research in translation continues today also in multiple domains related areas include comparative literature and it's also called world literature used to designate a sim- similar course of study and scholarship comparative literature is the more widely used term in the united states with many universities having comparative literature departments or comparative literature program and contrastive linguistics which is contrastive linguistics seeks to describe the differences and similarities between a pair of languages also occasionally called differential linguistics it includes contrastive descriptions that can occur at every level of linguistic structure speech sounds that is phonology written symbols that is graphology word formation morphology word meaning lexicology collocation phraseology sentence structure that is syntax and complete discourse that is texto textology various techniques used in corpus linguistics have been shown to be relevant in intralingual and interlingual contrastive studies for example by parallel text analysis by hartman you know evolution of uh, scientific systematic and linguistic oriented translation studies the systematic linguistics oriented approach to the study of translation began to emerge in the 1950s and 60s some representative some representative works are as follows a contrastive study of french and english which introduced key terminology for describing translation by paul and others in 1958 then nida in 1964 incorporated elements of chomsky's then fashionable generative grammar as a theoretical underpinning of his books which were initially designed to be practical manuals for bible translators to reach all scholars working in the field from whatever background crucially homes puts forward an overall framework describing what translation studies covers please see the figure 1 and figure 2 in the following slides let me explain to you the homes map of translation studies uh, please remember that this is uh, one way of uh, describing the translation studies and i won't say that this is the most established one or this is 
or where does it rank? But just as a case study, uh, which is very often uh, talked about, let us see this one. You, on, you have on the top the translation studies. If you see, it is divided into two on the left pure and on the right applied. The pure one, if you see, it divides further in very detailed manner. For example, pure becomes theoretical and the descriptive. Then theoretical is divided into journal, general and partial. Descriptive is divided into product oriented, process oriented and function oriented. Whereas the theoretical partial one is further divided into medium restricted, area restricted, rank restricted, text type restricted, time restricted or problem restricted. And just see on the other hand, that is the applied one. It talks about the three categories only, that is translator training, translation aids and translation criticism. Try to guess why the right side, that is the applied one, which is the most important for translation, is not so well defined. I'll, I'll take it up a little later. Let's see, can we do something on this applied one? Well, if you try to have these three translator training, translation aids and translation criticism further divided into subcategories, then translation training will have teaching methods, testing techniques, curriculum design. And on the other hand, translation aids will have IT applications, dictionaries, grammars, expert informants. Even the IT applications can be further detailed divisions could be uh, machine translation, corpora, CAD tools, online databases, internet searches, online forums. And the translation criticism also can be divided into revision, editing reviews, and editing also have editing oblique reviews, then evaluation of the translations. Now, if you look at it, you will find that the applied uh, part or applied aspect of the translation studies has not been studied so well so far. Based on what we have seen today, uh, let me talk about at the end uh, certain exclusive points which can be taken up as a conclusion or the summary of this particular module. Translation and translation studies are certainly not new academic domains. Many people say that translation is a comparatively new domain, but I don't agree. I very strongly feel that this is this has not been established so far, but this definitely has been a very uh, old domain. In any case, it goes without saying that it has expanded explosively in recent years with the commercial domination of the translation activity. Translation studies per se will only widen the gap between studies experts and the practitioners. Being scholars, studies experts will tend to dominate while the practitioners who own the methodologies, who develop the methodologies, who practices the methodologies and have very rich corpus of equivalents and know-how will resist being termed as blue collar. Translation as well as the translation studies will certainly boom from here onwards also in this age of movement and migration, more exchanges through globalization and localization, new concepts or new happenings, for example, word trade and patenting sanctions and terrorism. As the works of many experts, academicians, scholars, as well as practicing transla translators do not find place in public domains or an easily available bi bibliography, it is necessary to continue the study and add these findings by the individual researchers while adding flexibility to adopt new concepts and ideas. I hope you have understood uh, the last point which I have tried to make here, that the domain of translation and the domain of translation studies are very strongly interlinked uh, domains. There are two categories of people who are working on it. One is the scholars or the professors and the other is the translators or whom we call as practitioners. When these two people or these two categories of people, they work in their own silos, they tend to move away from each other. A professor or an academician will try to give a theory which may not be related so well by the practitioner. And a practitioner will talk something which professor or the scholar will find not very comfortable with. Therefore, it is very necessary that the two groups should work together, should come out with something which is mutually compatible, the way Google has done 
in its latest uh, online tool for the translation. And at the end, I would like to acknowledge the contribution made by Jatin Kumar, uh, the research intern at TSDCSAR NISCARE for the data collection and also for the preliminary study of the relevant material. Thank you so much for being with me here for the for this module, module 3. We meet again in the module 4.